Most classified employees provide in FY25 an average 9% step increase and 4.5% across the board increase for a total of a 6.4% increase. For FY26, it has the same language, um, but for the period from July 1st, 2025 through June 30th, 2026. And in this case, the collective bargaining agreements for most classified employees provide an FY26 an average, again, 1.9% step increase and 3.5% across the board increase for a total of a 5.4% increase. So 6.4% in FY25, 5.4% in FY26. So that is the collective bargaining agreements. For exempt employees uh, for FY25, this language allows, and this is really fairly standard language that's just updated for each pay act, the executive, judicial, and legislative branches may extend the FY25 provisions of the collective bargaining agreements funded by the act to employees not covered by the bargaining agreements as they determine to be appropriate and in accordance with the appropriations provided to each branch either in here or in the budget. Um, for FY26, same thing, the, the three branches may extend the provisions of the collective bargaining agreements to uh, non-covered employees as appropriate and within available appropriations um, or the amounts appropriated. Section three, um, for purposes of determining annual salary adjustments, sal special salary increases and bonuses under specific statutory provisions, there's this term you'll see show up later, the average rate of adjustment available to most classified employees under the collective bargaining agreement. And that is shorthand or longhand for 6.4%, but it's what it means is the 6.4% in FY25 and the 5.4% in FY26. Um, all right, so then we get into updating your question. Yeah, so the, I just want to make sure I understand what that, what, what that means is that in section three, it's applying the 6.4% and the 5.4% and the 6.4% respectively to the non-bargaining executive order. I think literally in this piece, what it means is um, yes, because it's saying for purposes of the way the language is used in, in the statutes, we're talking about 6.4% for FY25 and 5.4% for FY26. But that wasn't bargained because these are because these are exempt, bargaining. right? These are exempt or otherwise employees who are outside of the collective bargaining agreements. Then we get to several sections that update the statutory salary amounts um, for FY twenty five and twenty six. So you'll see starting on the top of page four uh, and striking through the existing statutes <clears throat> that show annual salaries as of July 3rd, 2022. So the first day of the pay period in uh, FY23 and the first day of the pay period in FY24 are struck. And we've got the new first days of the pay period, which are pretty late into July um, for FY25 and 26. And so the amounts um, that were provided to me by DHR, but I believe go up by the 6.4 and 5.4 percent. Just leave to Harold for uh, confirmation. So yes, yeah, so that is what is reflected in there. Um, and there is existing statutory language that um, talks about uh, the, um, there can be, um, salaries can be up to 50% above the base salary, so there is a maximum that is higher than what is here. Um, and then we get into on pages five, six, seven, we get into the secretaries and, and eight, um, the secretaries and commissioners, um, and again, updating their base salaries as of the beginning, uh, first pay periods of FY25 and 26 by that same 6.4 and 5.4. Um, and not otherwise making changes to those statutes. On page nine, um, we could certainly look at any of the numbers you want, but otherwise just know that they're increased from what has been in the statute, um, which was increased in the last pay act. Um, so starting on page nine, we have the judicial branch and the statutory salaries. So we've got the uh, chief justice, the associate justices, administrative judge, superior judges, magistrates, and judicial bureau hearing officers. And again, updating those statutory amounts for their salaries. In section six, the assistant judges um, are uh, 
entitled to receive compensation in a daily amount, and so those amounts are um, just like we have in the columns, except written out in paragraph form. So updating those amounts. Section seven, we have the probate judges. There are some differing amounts by county based on likely on the volume of um, the work that they are encountering, and so those amounts are updated accordingly. <coughs> On page 12, section 8 has the sheriffs. Um, the sheriff of Chittenden County has a higher salary than the sheriffs of all of the other counties, so it's separated out into sheriffs of all counties except Chittenden, and then uh, sheriff of Chittenden County. Um, section 9, state's attorneys, again, updating on a county by county basis um, those amounts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yes, Thank you. Can you just explain again why the Chittenden County Sheriff is called out separately? Uh, it's a higher amount, which, um, again, I, I will defer to others, I would assume, based on just the number of people mm -hmm. and occurrences of events and the number of staff necessary to supervise, mm -hmm. um, that that has been... Okay. The percent changes are like, the same. Percent changes are the same, right, but they, the gap between goes up slightly when you have a higher amount to start with. Okay. Um, for the state's attorneys, and this one which may be there later in the bill, um, I know some of the state's attorneys are part-time. Is the salary, yeah, you saw somewhere else that the salary was reduced if the person was in a part-time position. Is that true for state's attorneys as well, or is this the salary regardless of whether or not it's a part-time? I'm part going to defer to okay. CHR folks on that. Um, I do see lower amounts for a couple of them, but I'm not familiar with which positions are actually part-time. Yes, right, right. right. So that would be my yeah. assumption, but the part-time nature may be based on the volume of the work that is required in those counties, and so that's, um, that may be what has made the positions part-time if they're part-time because there's not a, a sufficient volume for full-time, but I, I don't have first-hand experience of any of that, so I will defer to others. All right, and then finally we get to the appropriations in section 10, starting at the bottom of page 14. Um, so for the executive branch, the first and second years of the two-year agreements between the state and the Vermont State Employees Association for the Defender General Non-Management Supervisory and Corrections Bargaining Units, and for purposes of appropriation, the state's attorney's office's bargaining unit for the period uh, of FY uh, 25 <clears throat> and 26. So from July 1st, 2024 through June 30th, 26, 2026, the collective bargaining agreement with the Vermont Troopers Association for that same period and salary increases for employees in the executive branch not covered by the bargaining agreements are funded as follows here. And so we have for FY 25, an amount of $27,279,337 appropriated from the general fund to the Secretary of Administration for distribution to the departments to fund the FY25 <coughs> collective bargaining agreements and the requirements of this act. There's also some amount of uh, transportation fund, 2.5 million is appropriated from the transportation fund to the Secretary of Administration for distribution to the Agency of Transportation and Department of Public Safety to fund, again, the FY25 collective bargaining agreements and the requirements of this act. Um, and then other funds, it directs the administration to provide additional spending authority to departments through existing, existing processes of excess receipts to fund the 2025 agreements and requirements of the act. The estimated amounts are 25627 at $25,627,057 um, from a special fund, federal funds, and other sources. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, sorry, and then we have uh, transfers. So with due regard to the possible availability of other funds for FY25, the Secretary of Administration is authorized to transfer the various appropriations and various funds and from the receipts of the Liquor Control Board such sums as the secretary determines necessary to carry out the purposes of this act to the various agencies supported by state funds. 
And then the whole thing plays out again for FY26 with differing amounts. So from the general fund, we have $24,644,442 appropriated to the Secretary of Administration, $3 million from the transportation fund, uh, additional spending authority through excess receipts, um, in estimated amounts of $27,868,854 from special fund, federal funds, and other sources. And again, the authority to uh, transfer from appropriations funds and receipts to the Liquor Control Board as needed to carry out the purposes of this act. Um, and this section must, shall include sufficient funding to ensure administration of exempt pay plans authorized under uh, for provision in Title 32. So that's all executive branch. We have the judicial branch um, and starts with an extension to non-covered employees that authorizes the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court to extend the provisions of the Judiciary's Collective Bargaining Agreement to judiciary employees not covered by that agreement. In FY25, we have the first of the two-year agreements uh, between the state and the Vermont State Employees Association for the judicial bargaining unit for the period of uh, FY25 and salary increases for employees in the branch not covered by the bargaining agreements are as follows. Uh, $2,470,963 is appropriated from the general fund and $185,986 from other sources to fund the FY25 collective bargaining agreement and requirements of this act. For FY26, uh, it, the appropriation is $2,388,783 from the general fund and $179,801 from other sources uh, to the judiciary for the FY26 agreement and the requirements of this act. Then we have the legislative branch. So for the first, for FY25, the General Assembly, including all legislative branch employees, is funded as follows. The amount of $884,808 is appropriated from the general fund to the legislative branch. And uh, for the period of July 1st, 2025 through June 30th, 2026, the General Assembly will be funded with $758,613 from the general fund. And that's for the increases. Um, and the effective date is July 1st. So, Jim, that, that, that one pays for eight people. So, I assume. I think that, that is just the increases. So that's just the increase, right? I'm looking at Catherine, but yeah, I believe just the, the increase in salary. The 800 and something to the legislature in each year is yes. just the increase. Yes. That's the increase. The, the that's base, that right? The base is already right. Okay. Uh, in our right. budget. Right. <coughs> and, sorry, just let me follow. Up. Is that true for air, all? Yes. It's just so the increase of the 27 million to the executive branch. Is that just the increase? Yes. Because the budget has the data. Everything is built. Right. Right. Got it. Got it. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Except for the salaries, which are explicitly called out as salaries. That's not an increase. Those are just straight salaries. Those you are their salary it. amounts, but the money in the appropriations provision just reflects the increase, I believe. So the, the numbers themselves are the whole number that mm. the person's salary yeah, is amount. in the column. The columns are the person's whole salary, but it's not appropriating it. It's just specifying what their salary it's is, salary. and it's the appropriation okay. that has Right. Piece in the base Thanks. in the budget was, and the increases in here. Sorry, right. Senator Watson. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm sure this is probably boilerplate language just to do this all the time. I'm wondering if <clears throat> there is there I, just for the sake of clarity, I mean what I am understanding from the pay increases is that uh, the six point four percent is from the just the prior year. Um, and that the 5.4% is from the, I'll try to, how do I? Year over it's, year. It's right, it's year over year, as opposed to like, you're calculating 6.4% and 5.4% from the same base. Right, Does that make no, sense? right. I believe it is 6.4% applied, right. and then 5.4% of that combined number. And no one would, and especially because we've specified like the, the actual values in here, no one would interpret that as like, as being calculated from the same number. Don't okay. believe so, because I think it's the whole, whole systems are built on doing on it. On the year over year. year, okay. over year. I just want to make sure that it was clear. Thank you. Any other questions for 
And to be clear, because it's not explicit in here, but the um, because the the increases for members of the General Assembly are tied to the increases for the constitutional officers. Um, yours would yes. salaries would go up by the same percentages mm -hmm. that are in here. We did that explicitly two or four years ago. Yeah, four, I think, that. something like that. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So you, you're not listed specifically separately, but that's how that works. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Jen. Sure. Back in. Um, Dr. I don't say the thing, or I, I will ask you, is the money in the budget for this? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And we'll see it in B104 in, um, in the version on the Senate agenda. It's uh, just a big picture appropriation number. Yeah. Not, not too detailed. Okay. Yes, I checked as soon as I got this. Um, uh, so the, the money is in the bill, in the budget bill, but the language is not. Okay. So um, that's, um, and there's still a conversation about how it will travel, the language part will travel. Um, so, um, uh, Commissioner, excuse me, you want to come up? Sure. And actually, I've got, um, you have a crew? With I have you? a crew. So is that, crew? I would like to bring my crew. Okay, as long as you all can fit and there are chairs, oh. you're welcome to move the furniture. Yes. Yeah. The chairs Do you guys not want to be trying to move the chairs? Yeah, they're so, no. So, do you prefer? All right. Oh, just okay. talk loud. This year, okay. Okay. I'm going to go like this. Okay. I'm going to go like this. Are you guys not going to go like this? No, we're going to go like this. Oh, we're going to get crowded over there. I'm going to go like this. I bathed. I'm pretty sure. So, um, so uh, make eye contact. All right, everyone. Let's get back in it. Do you want to introduce yourself and have your team introduce myself so we know who everybody is in case they chime in? I would be delighted to. I am Beth Fastigy. I am the Commissioner of the Department of Human Resources. And with me is John Berard. He is our Director of Labor Relations. So he negotiates the collective bargaining agreements on behalf of the administration. And then Harold Schwartz is the Director of Operations. And he's our money guy. Money guy in this, okay. <laughs> in this, in this situation. And so I think we'll introduce ourselves. Great. So you've been in here before. <clears throat> Ever you have. But, um, not sure who have. So um, I'm Senator Ruth Hardy. I represent the Addison District. I'm Olivia Parker. I'm the Senator Tony Vyoski. I represent the Chittenden Central District. Uh, hi, I'm Rebecca White, and I represent the Windsor County District. I'm one of three. Hi, Bob Norris. I represent Franklin and the town of Elberg in the county of Grand Isle. Senator Ann Watson for the Washington District. Allison Clarkson from the Windsor County <coughs> District. There you go. There's us. We know you now, and you want to just yep. tell us what you'd like us to know. Right. So our testimony today is to act, ask you to support the funding for the PAY Act. Um, this is this funds the pay and benefits of the collective bargaining agreements for fiscal year 25 and 26, as well as funding um, the parameters of that and the treatment for employees that are not covered by the collective bargaining agreements. So that's our request. Um, and then we put together some highlights of the collective bargaining agreements. This is not the complete agreement. And also I put on the, um, we did submit paperwork and you can link to the current collective bargaining agreements. They're each like several, they're very big tomes. And there are also some changes that we have bargained for changing the agreements that I didn't put on the list, but these are the ones that are kind of the highlights. So if you wanted, I can go through those or. Um, yeah, that would be great. Okay. Maybe a sort of what the process is sure. that you use to get here for those of us who are, this yep. is our first time going Absolutely. Through. So we so have- I just want to point out that this is like one of the few points where we actually do tie the hands of a future legislator. We always say, oh, we can't, we can't commit future legislatures to doing this, but actually in this act, we do. So and every time we do that, and about that. <laughs> yeah, you can still undo it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, we do. And in statute, there are um, dates and deadlines related to collective bargaining so that by the time we're here and at this point, there is something to provide to you so that you can appropriate, so appropriate it. So the first step is we start to bargain <coughs> with the unions. Um, the, our team bargains with the VSEA and the Vermont Troopers Association. With the VSEA, we bargain 
my team bargains three of the bargaining agreements, which are the um, non-management, the corrections, and the supervisor bargaining, bargaining units. The Defender General also has a bargaining unit, and the Defender General bargains that separately also with the VSCI. And then states attorneys and sheriffs also are represented by the VSCA, and they do that bargaining independently. And judiciary also um, has a bargaining unit with the VSCA one, I think, and they bargain that independently as well. And Harold actually provides a lot of the support there and provides all of the um, bargaining data on what different things are going to cost. So that's the first thing we do <laughs> is we meet. And John and his bargaining team um, meet with the various unions and try to negotiate something at the table. Um, if you can't negotiate something at the table, the next step would be mediation. We, work, we would work with a federal mediator, which is free. Well, our taxes pay for that. And then, <laughs> and then if we don't come to an agreement with the mediator, um, we can go to what's called a fact-finding process which is kind of like a, a mini board hearing, right? It's non-binding so arbitration. Non, and then it's right. non-binding arbitration. And then we have an opportunity, once that is finished, we put our, put our final proposals on the table and the fact finder will choose one of those. Oh. And then... The fact finder can cherry pick. So the fact finder provides a recommendation to the parties uh, <clears throat> in hopes of driving a settlement there's a cooling off period after fact finding for about two weeks, uh, during which the parties are supposed to reflect on what the fact finder report was. Mm -hmm. And if we can use it as a base to reach an agreement, then we reach an agreement. If we don't reach an agreement in fact finding, then we go to what's called last best offer. So that's binding arbitration. And that goes to an actual arbitrator unless the parties agree mutually to use the Vermont Labor Relations Board. And then that's what we often call kind of baseball arbitration, which is that arbitrator has to pick one package or the other. He can't or she can't cherry pick. It's one or the other, and whatever one they pick, that's the one that gets costed and sent over to the legislature for appropriation. And the big difference is when we reach an agreement at the table, like we did this time, the governor is obligated to uh, fund it in his budget and obviously support it. So as opposed to an imposed, uh, an imposed contract, which uh, just comes directly to the legislature for funding. And that's why we hear a difference in you sitting down and saying you support it and want us to fund it. And because at this part, point, we're used to the opposite, where this is not in the governor's budget. So right. it's refreshing. <laughs> right. We are, we are the, both the VSEA and the VTA, once we, we haven't finalized negotiations with the VTA yet. But once we get to that point, we are, I mean, we, we have a contract with them and we're obligated to support that contract. <clears throat> and if for some reason that you did not appropriate, make the appropriation that was in that contract, you appropriated something else, we would actually have to go back and bargain that. But the timelines in statute are all set up so that we get to this point, we're here with you that, you got, that, that the legislatures can make a decision on and put in the budget. Mm -hmm. Sorry, folks. So John, this was just final. You just finished the PAC negotiations, right? I mean, he didn't have them in time for the budget in January, did he? Um, um, so when did you finish negotiating? I, I guess we, well, we okay. finished negotiations with the SEA in December. So why are we just getting the PAC now with three weeks to go in the legislature? I have no, I cannot answer that question, Senator. So you've had the PAC all set for so the so I think part of it is that um, the both the Senate and the House Government Operations Committees are new and it wasn't on their radar and between us and the VSE we've been talking have you heard anything about PAC no have you heard anything so no one had really heard anything about PAC so we reached out to the committee chairs and said hey um, <laughs> we need not, to just, yeah but that's uh, not what I was told okay um, I. And <laughs> I never, yeah, I had yeah, never initiated so, a pay act previous to this. I had, always, it had always been kind of the legislature would reach out to us through, usually through Ledge Council. So I think that was part of a. Night, both John and I are new to this. So right. I think everybody was new and we we're just expecting the legislature to reach out and they I think didn't. I mean, Catherine reached out a while ago. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, and I might mm -hmm. also understand was there was an issue of waiting for the ratification of it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was that was, was that it wasn't ratified until late March, uh, early uh, April. Right. And that we oh. couldn't start it until oh. that's what I was under the impression. I thought maybe the pre preference that's is correct. not to start it. I mean, we could, we could still move forward into the language because the money was in the governor's budget even from, I mean, it was in the governor's budget when he's when the governor submitted the budget so we we have to budget start budgeting for for this well before well before negotiations are completed so there are times when so as i said we're not finished with the vta yet but in this appropriation there's enough money we're confident there's enough money to cover the vta if there wasn't and we still didn't last time actually we didn't. We have an agreement in principle with right. VTA that has yet to be ratified. And, and I'm sorry, I answered your question literally, <laughs> Senator, that we finished in December, but it, the collective bargaining agreements weren't ratified by the membership until no, I, I, February. Yeah, that helps. Right. I guess I would have uh, preferred that we have done this budget, on, uh, this bill under the regular process. So yeah. it was uh, led to believe that we had to wait until it be ratified, and then I. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I don't think that there's been right. I don't know that there's definitely like a set or a process on how to do on how to do the legislative part. But okay, and yeah, I'm sorry if um, there was miscommunication and we could have been here earlier to be discussing this as well. I one thing that mentioned that the governor's recommend did include some numbers on this, and. I wasn't even paying attention to those numbers when we did the, all the calcs and they came in, general fund came in <clears throat> a million dollars less than what the governor's number was mm -hmm. at that point. <laughs> so the budget, the Senate proposed budget carries the lower, the low number. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, wonderful. An extra million dollars. Are there <laughs> questions for Please. the commissioner, oh. Senator White? So what are we doing next year then? No, this is this, this is, is two covers two years. No. Oh, so what are we going to do then? Is the plan that we reach out to them? Oh, or they reach oh, out to in us? two years. Two, it will yeah. be in two oh. years. Um, Just so know. I know if I still happen to be around. I don't know. Well, I think that whoever is here in two years can cross that bridge. Um, and, and Harold and John, uh, as as a uh, as classified employees, hopefully will be here in two years for sure. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> There's a lot, there are Hopefully, a lot of things yeah. that have to happen before yeah. <laughs> to see who's, who's here. So, um, but you know, I guess one, one thing, Ruth, is that if, if it's in the budget, it, it, it should like show up in the budget. So we should all see it there and know it's there, even if it hasn't been ratified. Right? So the House has already dealt with it. No? It's, it wasn't, I thought you said it wasn't it's, in the governor's it's, budget. It was in the governor's budget, but as the, so as you're looking at the details of the collective bargaining agreement and the 4.5% across the board increase that was bargained for for 2025 and then the 3.5% across the board increase, until those are ratified by the membership of the unions, those, those numbers aren't public. So if we had had draft language oh. prior, if we had had the draft language of all the salaries that was talking about the across the board increases, which is what people think of as a um, COLA or a, mm, yep. you know, so if, if that wasn't in there, if that was in there, then that would be, um, then that would not be appropriate because the membership hadn't agreed that that would, even though that might be what we bargained, the membership wouldn't have agreed so to it by that point. So what you are saying is that until it's ratified, the language can't be drafted because exactly. that's basically saying, you know, yeah. like right. showing your hand before right. it's finalized. Mm -hmm. So that is what happened. It's not because yes. we have new chairs or a new legislative council or a new JFO. It is because you can't actually write the language publicly until it's ratified. That makes sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just want to be clear for the record about okay. why we're here this week. And, and this is not <clears throat> this is not atypical for us to be here. Oh, this it, is very. Typical. This is normal yeah. for us to be here yeah. talking Almost. about it in April and May. Okay. Yeah. That it's is. It would be easier if we could do it earlier, so that the time right. is a little. Fun. And and sometimes we can. Year. So if we can get an agreement at the table, we this time we went to meeting. Well, for. We went to mediation for all three, and we went to fact-finding for two. 
So there are times last time we probably were, maybe not a little sooner, I don't know. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was. Yeah, because the contracts were ratified earlier. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I remember, I, I was on post government operations, and I remember kind of being like, where's the pay act? It feels really late. So. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. Um, okay. our, so, Commissioner Fis Fastigi has some uh, a sort of like bullet points on our website, just so yep. you know. Um, and of, of, of potential interest to this committee, because we did a bill relating to it, there they did um, in the agreement provide uh, Juneteenth as a holiday, a paid holiday, or but got rid of Bennington Battle Day. Is that for the corrections bargaining unit? Oh, for just for the corrections bargaining unit. Yeah. Okay. Intriguing. The other two units, we could reach an agreement on the okay. holidays. <laughs> Um, Maybe next time. This came up when we were doing the bill about Juneteenth right. about whether, and it was like, oh, it's being, it's bargained. We don't touch it in the bill, so it's just kind Here of interesting to see it on the list. Senator Hills, what happens if you can't come to an agreement on holidays? It's part of the, it's part of the benefits package. So if we, if it were such a disagreement that the parties couldn't agree on the whole deal, then we'd end up the last best offer over holidays. Okay, so what you're saying is that is not what happened. What happened is there wasn't an agreement, so it kind of just got left to be as a part of the right. So right, okay. so we reached an agreement to the changes um, where we provided uh, Indigenous Peoples Day and Juneteenth to the Corrections Bargaining Unit, effectively in exchange for Battle of Day. Okay. The other two units. It's a good exchange. The <laughs> other two units, uh, we just we couldn't reach an agreement with them on on similar language. So, but it didn't take down the whole But it did not right. take down the whole deal. Okay. That's correct. That's what I was trying to understand. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. I do not the So, they're, they're still we hard. Have, we have three <laughs> agreements. Okay. So, it's <laughs> good. Yes, they're still holidays. Um, so, question. So, Senator Hills, you have a question. So, I don't mean this to be snarky, but I, 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 I am a little interested that that you're allowed to bargain independent of the global notion, I understand from our governor, that everything has to come in at 3%. That's when we begin to completely star state government. So I am just curious that you guys are free from that um, objective, which is, I think, great. But um, it, it, it's interesting. Everybody else is really, all the departments are so tied. So what's tied to that 3%? Not salaries, just cost of doing business? So the um, so what is in the pay act? That's the incremental amount. So that is it funds for 2024. So departments' budgets were asked to keep their budgets to the three percent increase. That doesn't account the salary increases that are accounted for in pay act. So the pay act funding provides that funding to be able to do that, but it. Um, and as well as what we call as the average value of a step, which is that 1.9%. Um, <clears throat> so employees in the classified service are on a step plan. And at the beginning, early on, you get a step every year. And then it goes to every two years. And then towards the end, it's every three years. So if you're an employee and you're in a year where you're going to get a step, your raise is actually, your, it's actually more than 1.9%. <clears throat> but that 1.9% accounts for the employees that don't get anything as well as the employees that are getting something. So the average value of the step is not every classified employee is not getting 1.9%. Some are getting maybe three, between 3 and 4% maybe with 3 and 4%. Average, the, average value, the average value of a step if, if the classified service got one every year is about 3.19%. So they move the along. Actual the actual cost is right. one, uh, one point nine because not everybody steps every year. Mm. So it's a weighted average. Thank you. Yes, we. So that so, right. So and that's what they that's <laughs> what they're using for exempt employees. And when you look at the or the employees that aren't um, part of the collective bargaining agreement, like the most a lot of those employees are employees that are classified that might be managerial or confidential employees that are not able to be part of bargaining units are also a big portion of that is the attorneys we have in state government. Um, they are not eligible for collective bargaining. So within the attorney general's office or embedded in all the departments, those folks um, also, they would get the 1.9%. And that's the majority of the exempt employees are attorneys. <laughs> 
Um, so can you talk to me a little bit about what kind of like salary studies you do for employees and how those work? Yeah, so so typical, well, our, um, we have one person who, uh, Doug Pine, is, who is our director of um, compensation and recruiting. So when we do salary studies, he's the one that's looking at those. Um, when we, um, so when we hire, uh, like uh, the, for the attorneys, we actually have a pay plan. So on how to slot attorneys in for pay, um, there's, a, there's <coughs> other employees that there's not a pay plan. So we do, we look at across state government, whether people kind of doing similar jobs are being paid, what they're paying in the external marketplace. So if, if the exempt employee isn't on the pay plan, those are the types of things we look at. So it's not necessarily, it's more based on when we're hiring somebody, this is what we're going to do rather than a broad-based study. And do you use that? I mean, I noticed, and I had, didn't know this before until Jen, Jen walked us through the bill, that, that and, and you and I chatted about this, the maximum salary for each appointed officer shall be 50% above the base salary. Do you use that uh, authority as part of setting the salaries? Yes. And, and do you do uh, pay studies to try to figure out if it, using that authority is necessary, or how do you know when Right. So Secretary of Administration, every year, once um, once the Pay Act is approved, then, sh then the Secretary looks at um, how exempt employees would be treated as part of that. So for example, last time, um, the classified service got their across the board increase for fiscal year 24, plus a thousand dollar lump sum. Exempt employees actually didn't get the $1,000 lump sum. They just got the same as the across the board increase in the ABI. So the Secretary of Administration kind of looks at what's happening across state government um, and, and determines who might, who are the exempt employees and how they might be treated accordingly. I would say that, um, and then the previous year with the lumps, there was also, there's a $1,500 lump sum and then only exempt employees that were making a certain amount or less got got the lump sum of $1,500 and people are, I think, I don't remember the amount, I think it was over, <clears throat> I don't remember the amount, mm -hmm. got, got that lump sum. So there, so there is definitely that taken into pl place. What's um, the, um, all the judges and all of the, you know, the state's attorneys and all the elected officials, they are all set in statute. So that, what is in statute is what we pay them unless they tell us, don't pay me that much. So unless someone so none of these people are getting paid fifty percent more. No, well, the only people that could get fifty percent more are the um, when you look at the executive branch portion, it's the secretaries and the commissioners mm -hmm. are in there, and those salaries are could be so that what you're seeing is the base salary of one hundred percent, and then the statute the Pay Act allows us to go to a, up to one hundred and fifty up to 50% more than that. Uh -huh. So if it's 100, 000, if the base is 100,000, we could pay up to 150,000 for that role, except for the um, commissioner of the Department of Health, we can pay 100% um, more. So if the base was 100, I could pay the commissioner of the Department of Health um, 200,000. Yeah, and if you look at the top. So these are really the, the, uh, the minimum salaries that they're paid, unless they say, I want to be a martyr and don't pay me that much. Right, mm -hmm. typically, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and do when you do the salary studies, do you look at full compensation, like our benefits package? Yes. And, and not just the salary that's... Yeah. And that's, that's for all our state... That's that's how... I mean, it's, it's a challenging recruitment environment out there across the board for frontline workers um, and people who are entry level, like beginning their careers, people who are... We're trying to hire as leaders across, you know, across the industry. It's a tough, it's a difficult job market for employers. Mm -hmm. So, and it is difficult for us to compete on salary. Um, so that is our value proposition for sure is our benefits packages. Mm -hmm. um, we have great pension plans. We have, um, you know, for the classified folks, we have a defined benefits pension plan. For exempt employees, they can choose between that plan or a different or another plan. We have our health benefits are fantastic. So that's really a big part of our value proposition and working for the state of Vermont and the some of the things we use to help recruit people for all positions across state government. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I mean, I 
I'm looking at on page four the elected officers mm -hmm. and just something that pops out to me is the governor's salary in 2025. Um, based on this year's governor salaries, um, if this were to go through, he would be the second highest paid governor in the country, um, assuming all the other states kept their salaries <clears throat> the same. New York is 250000 um, and everything else would be lower than that, including California. Um, so that just strikes me as a high salary compared to the market. I mean, if you're looking at the market for governors, um, it's a high salary and we're the second smallest state. So I'm wondering if there's a possibility of doing some kind of market analysis on the chief executive salary and to see if it's within, I, I know actually the state of Maine did this recently. Um, they increased their governor salary because their governor salary um, is has actually one of the lowest in the country. It's um, uh, just looking it up here. It's seventy thousand mm -hmm. dollars for the governor of Maine, wow. and they did a study and increased the governor's salary in Maine because it was so low. Um, but I, I don't think they increased it anywhere near. Um, so I'm wondering if there's ever been any work done on on comparing executive salaries at that level, and I, I know. You and I chatted briefly, yeah. and you did mention the governor's mansion. And there's not a governor's mansion in Vermont, but <laughs> there are. There are. A, there is a very generous um, uh, employee true. benefits package, and so I'm wondering if there's yeah. been any work looking at that across yeah. the country. I can't. I don't know what what states. You know, housing is included in their governor's compensation package. I, I'm guessing those are just salaries. They aren't total compensation. Um, I don't know what type of studies are already out there. Um, I imagine governor salaries are public record, which is why you probably have a list of that. Yeah. Um, what they, what else they get for benefits that you know supplements that salary? I don't know. I know that the governor of Vermont gets the same benefits that the other regular state employees get. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the data I'm looking at is from the Council of State Government. Yeah. Um, so they have a right great website yeah. on this. It just it seems, you know, when you compare it to the, the pay increase that other state workers are getting, the benefit package that other state workers are getting, maybe it's not out of line, but when you compare it to what other governors are getting, right. it seems quite out of line. Right. And looking at the other, um, the other, um, like if the, you know, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, um, the governor makes slightly above the Chief Justice, would continue to make slightly above the Chief Justice, the Chief Justice, you know, makes slightly above the uh, the rest of the, the other judges and you know as you're looking at the judiciary and also the other elected officials you kind of look at there is there is a, a there is a stratification there and it, it you know compared to the other elected officials um, in the, in state government um, the governor does make more but the scope of job eight thousand employees versus you know uh, under a hundred for all the elected governors of it. Governor's offices, or I mean, governor's elected officials' offices are probably mostly less than 100. You know, some are even smaller than that. I think the auditor is the smallest. Um, so, you know, I'm. This is this is how we do it, and this is the treatment that we've done in the past, and it keeps salaries consistent with what's happening with the rest of the rest of the rest of the folks. So. Senator I certainly appreciate, um, you know, just doing a quick Google search, it looks like Chief just the average salary for a state Chief Justice in 2021 was 280000 so compared to 70000 for the Governor of Maine, it seems like other states don't necessarily track that way. And if we're comparing to other elected officials, I think it's really important to talk about the General Assembly and the lack of benefits and lack of livable wages and pay. And so it's, it's tough to sit and look at a well above average, second highest potentially in the country, pay for the chief executive officer while they were the most <clears throat> paid general assemblies. And so I guess I wonder in, in any pay consideration how that how do you square with that? Well I know that's something that this committee and you in particular have been advocating for um, over the past <laughs> certainly over the past two years. And um, as you've mentioned it's very hard to attract um, young people or people who don't have independent means to participate in the state legislature because of the lack of benefits and and um, the and the pay. So, okay. 
Senator Watson. Thank you. On that point, I just want to be clear. So um, <laughs> part C, um, sorry, page 18, um, under the legislative branch, um, the two values that are there. <clears throat> I only printed out. I didn't. Uh, do you happen to know, and maybe this is, I guess, for anybody in the room, do you happen to know if the values that are um, cited there are 6.4% and 5.4% increases, or are they just um, the 4.5 and 3.5 since you don't get steps? Oh. They're the full 6 4. Okay. 6 Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and this is for all legislative branch employees. So that's like the, um, the staff. It does apply to us, too. Correct. And it I, yeah, does. I don't know if the. It does. Oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. You're running again. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. can I just clarify? So, steps are for whom versus the 6.4% increase, which is what I was referring to compared to the 3%. But sorry. Okay. So the mandate, yeah. Steps, okay. steps are for the people, the classified people. So, that's for. Only classified employees. Some exempt positions have step plans as well, um, or have some sort of levels to them, but the majority do not. So we have exempts who follow the classified pay plan, we have exempts who don't have a pay plan, we have exempts with their own pay plan. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but when we talk about steps, what we're really looking at are the value of steps for the majority of the workforce there, which is the classified workforce. And what percent are classified versus exempt? Here. We've um, got in the workforce report. Oh, right. Your it's staff bills for a workforce report. In excess of 80%. 80% of classified in excess. This is your committee. That's your committee copy. Oh, but we love this report. It's your committee copy. It's OK then. Uh, you can hang it. It gives us a good sense. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're going to move on. Okay. And if you're able to hang out, or are you, do you need to leave? I can be here certainly for a little bit longer. I'm okay. not not until the wee hours, but no, no, we're not going into the wee hours. Don't I worry. can be I here. Oh, the house looks like it um, is. They may be um, till four thirty or something. No, no. I am always oh, when you're done. Yeah, that's I can't. Uh, I have, I so, have so here, but, Terry, are you? I was like, how did you know? Are are you you know? Do okay. Okay. Is Annie you didn't mind us because she heard the questions that were related to state's attorneys and sheriffs. So do you mind? Do you mind? Should I go to her? Okay, great. Annie. Are you there, Annie? <laughs> Hi, Annie Newman. We cannot hear or see. Oh, we can see you. Awesome. We can't hear you yet. Maybe your headphones? Nope. You're muted you're now. Now you're muted. Unmute. Maybe we got gotcha. you. No. no. Oh, darn. I feel like I heard her for a second. Maybe I mentioned her. Just come on over. I mean, when the this happens to me, my go to is always leave and come back. Mm. Yes, leave yeah. and come back. <laughs> We're going to, okay, then we are going to go to Terry and then we'll come back to you, Annie. Thank you. Actually, I, I can't say that I worked with Annie on the numbers for the state's attorneys and sheriffs that are integrated into the, uh, into this bill. You know, yeah, we know they're integrated they're, they're into the bill. Right. We know that, but we had quite specific questions, so I think it would be best to hear from Annie. Um, but Annie, why don't you leave and come back and we'll, we'll take Terry. So um, do you want to come on up, Terry? Oh, sure, I just said something. To, I, I thought the state attorneys aren't part of the executive branch. For the purposes of, of this, we put them in the executive branch. Just arbitrary. Mm. Well, well no, it's just clear. the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs exists solely to create oh, a single course. point of appropriation. Got it, got it. Just for Thank you, Jim. No, that wasn't my plan. What are you All right, okay. Um, hi, Terry. Hi. Thank you for your patience. Oh, my pleasure. Terry Corson, State Court Administrator, and I'm also with Chief, um, uh, Greg Mosley, who's the Chief of Finance oh, and Administration of the Judiciary, who, who definitely knows how to see you. Nice yeah. to see you. And you heard our introduction, so we'll. Yes. Okay, awesome. Yes. And thank you. And we actually. If you want to come up and sit with Terry, sure. you can. 
Thank you. Bob's got me up there. And we didn't know what in particular you might like us to address. We also support the Pay Act and very much appreciate the committee's consideration. We didn't come prepared to go into detail other than that these figures reflect what we had submitted and what we understand um, for the personnel that's involved. Okay. It's accurate. And I think I had a question about the, um, that's great. Um, I had a question about the assistant judges, and sure. I'm not sure because they're a little different in here than yes. the others. Uh -huh. And um, they, I'm trying to get the page that they're on. Ten. They're on page uh, ten. ten. Okay. And they're paid by the day. Do you? Um, can you? explain why they're different and how this ends up working out in reality. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I, I believe there's only one county where assistant judges work full time and that's Chittenden County. Okay. And so in the other counties, um, they're kind of prorated based on the hours that they'll work, but they're, they're paid at the equivalent day rate. Okay. And so this is for only when they're working in their capacity as an assistant judge not in their capacity as a county executive correct and that when they're in their capacity as a county executive they're paid by the county is that correct it's actually the reverse if i understand oh, correctly look. which is surprising okay yeah um, um if they're um covering their um work as assistant judges in the county in their official duties um then they're paid actually by the state that's no, the, and then if you're, they sit as an assistant judge, that's when they're paid by the county. Oh. Which is to me the reverse of what it would. That doesn't look right. Okay. That's odd. They're, they're essentially, they're classified as temporary employees of the judiciary. So okay. our, the, we have, that must be what, 28 temps that are essentially assistant judges. So if they are not sitting in court, here working by the next to a judge. Sitting with a judge. We should yeah. check that because I don't think that's right. Well, I, I've always thought it was the reverse, but yeah. that's how it has been. Oh, the In language? Honesty. Yeah. Wait, is it in current law that you're reading? That yeah, I'm, I'm reading it's it now. It's not in striker exactly. cab. Uh, well, it's in section B, um, when they uh, shall be paid by the county at the state rate established in subdivision A when an assistant judge is sitting with a presiding judge in a civil or family division. This came about when there was an issue about their rate of pay. And I remember looking at it and saying, this is the opposite of what you would expect, but that's how it has always been, from what I understand. And then when they're sitting in their, you know, I, I'm going to say in their um, administrative capacity, overseeing the county functions, um, that's when they are paid actually by the state, <laughs> at least based when, on the language. When they're sitting on the bench, at a, and a, there's a judicial officer on the bench, uh -huh. we don't. The county pays them for that because they're not sitting adjudicating that case. Okay, that's when they're paid by the county sitting with a presiding judge. Yeah. Oh, so this is only when they're sitting alone. Yes. For there, there's a few assistant judges that are trained to be able to do yes. certain types of they cases. They do small claims and judicial. No longer small claims. No, no longer. No. Yeah, I can't remember divorce. what it is. Uh, uncontested divorces. Divorce so, uncontested yeah. divorces yeah. and judicial bureau. Right. Um, so if, if they right. join a, a, a judicial officer, for example, a civil trial, they're not paid by the state. Paid by the county. Yes. Okay, so this is only for when they're sitting by themselves hearing a case without another judge with them. Correct. Okay, um, so it's almost like, or maybe it is in actuality, they're the presiding judge <laughs> yeah. because there's nobody else there. Yeah, right. And so they get this daily rate. Yep. And in no other case does the judiciary pay them. Everything else comes from the county. Even if there was, Senator, can, sorry, I, can I ask a question? <laughs> so when, they're, when they are sitting with another judge or when they're doing the books for the county, the county pays them. Yes. Okay. So and then that's because we uh, we wouldn't want to uh, encourage them to sit on civil cases and then drive up uh, our costs if um, if we don't need them to be adjudicating that case. Okay. So do the, does the presiding judge ask them to sit with them, or how who determines when there's going to be an assistant judge there? It's the assistant judge's discretion. 
Oh, so. And some sit fairly regularly, some sit rarely. I see. So what you what you're saying is you didn't want it to be like, oh, well, I'll sit regularly, so I get paid more yes. from the state. So it's I see. Okay. So so really, the proportion of their pay that comes from the state is very small. In most counties, that's correct. And if they are not in good standing with the Supreme Court for whatever reason, you wouldn't allow them to sit in a case by themselves. I'm right. Assuming. The chief superior judge would determine when they can sit alone, if you will, judicial uh -huh. bureau or uncontested divorces. I think those are the only two categories. Um, so if they are not in good standing with the court, you wouldn't they would not get this pay because they wouldn't be asked to sit alone. That's my understanding. I can confirm that with Judge Zone A. That would be great if we could yeah. get that confirmed. I mean, yeah. it seems like that's the case, but um, yeah. um, um, that would be great to know. But in uh, the other cases, even if they're if they're in not in good standing with the court, can they still sit as an assistant judge? Is it next to the superior judge, or would the superior judge say, no, you can't be here because you're not in good standing? I think the Judicial Conduct Board actually would determine that, whether or not, for example, they might be suspended or uh -huh. removed. And, and if the Judicial Conduct Board did suspend or remove them, would they be told you can't sit even as a, on a, as a side judge? Um, I can also clarify that. that. I, I assume so. Okay. But, okay. Um, that would be great. Okay. Um, and then probate judges, are the, is there a salary? 100% state, or um, is that county? Uh, Chittenden is the only full-time probate judge, if I understand, and then the rest are based, um, they're part-time judges, based on a formula that I think was devised some years ago, maybe at the time of the restructuring, uh, looking at, mm -hmm. as mentioned, volume of cases um, yeah. per county. So this m amount that is in here right now, so I'll just pay by my own county, Addison. the, the 20, 2024 76555 is that a part-time amount or is that the full-time amount that that's then's prorated that's that's the part-time amount this is the part-time amount yes. so only chitton county is full-time right correct okay um okay and if they're not in good standing with the court with the, the supreme court mm. they don't get to sit in a case at all they're removed from the bench is that correct yeah. Um, You're off the financial topic. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to defer yeah. to Terry. It's relevant, though, to their salary, so I'm just curious. Right. And I would think with the Judicial Conduct Board, it would be... Or, or the Judicial Conduct Board. Right. So, yeah. And that did come up, if I remember correctly, yeah. with a probate judge who was uh, suspended. Exactly. And then there was some question. They yeah. ended up withdrawing from even running. Right. Um, so, but there was this period while, where they were not allowed to hear cases, but they were still getting... Uh, were they still getting paid? That was uh, that's a question. So if you wouldn't mind, I'll get clarified on that. that. Would be one. I, I think it was addressed, but I honestly don't remember the details about how it was resolved. But that was definitely the issue. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. That would okay. Be great to understand that how the pay worked in those cases. Okay. Okay. Um, and also with the assistant judges, when if they're um, okay, Senator Dehoski. So this, I'm just trying to understand, and it may sort of be belaboring the same point. So in this instance. If the judge, the assistant judge or the judge isn't asked to sit, they don't get paid. So if they were suspended, they're not getting any pay. Am I, am I, miss, am I missing something or is that the they, case? They may well get paid by the county for their county duties, if you will, in terms of sitting on the bench. They'd only get paid for whatever time they're actually sitting on the bench. Okay, thank you. And there's a minimum, I think, two hours, and then it's even an hourly rate. So the daily rate would only be if they worked for the entire day. Okay. For, and that's just when they're hearing cases on their own, though. So. The judicial um, bureau. Um, right, and I don't, I don't know what the county rate of pay is when they're sitting as a side judge. Um, that's a good question. Yeah, that I don't know. Okay. Um, Senator Clarkson, do you have a question? Yeah, just it, it, because I've always heard that, that being a side judge is a pretty good gig. And, and it's interesting, it's sort of like the sheriffs, it's kind of cobbled together through a number of different pockets. The county budget, and they set the county budget. Right, which is one of the least, I mean, I'm sure it's transparent, it's just none of us tend to pay as much attention to it as we should. And I think they might, for example, get benefits from the county budget part of it. But they don't, they're not part of your benefits package, no? Not just no. daily rate? No. 
What about the probate judges? Do they get the state benefits? Yeah, I yes. believe so. Okay. okay. This is very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, are there any Senator Vigos? And the probate judges, if for some reason one of them was not in good standing with the judicial board, right? Finally. Judicial conduct board. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, would they still be entitled to their full salary? And that's what I'm going to research okay. for Senator yeah. Hardy. The question did come up. And, yeah. But I don't remember exactly. Well, I don't did, know for sure, but I think they did not get paid, and a and a probate judge from a nearby county covered the cases. That's what I after a certain point in time, though. Yeah. When yeah. the issue I think arose to the surface. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> if we could just get clarity. That would be wonderful. Yeah. Um, thank you. Are there any other questions for the judiciary when it comes to sell? Does the I'll ask you the same question I was asking the executive branch. Does the judiciary ever do sort of um, salary studies to see if you're paying your judges? I do know that there's a nationwide um, informal survey that we were asked to submit our judge figures to. Uh -huh. And my recollection is, is that uh, nationwide, um, it's it's we're probably in the middle of the pack. Yes. When you factor in cost of living, we're lower because uh -huh. yep. <laughs> there's a higher apparently cost of living, at least according to this chart for the judges. Um, so I'm going to say middle of the pack, and then if you factor in cost of living, we're paid less than the middle of the pack. Do you have that chart? Is that something you could share with us? I'm I'm sure. So, so it's something that the National Center for State Courts does that I know I've gotten, okay. and I'm happy to forward it on. Um, we can, uh, our well, my very, I can Google it, but my very brief Google also sort of showed our judges roughly kind of in the middle of the pack. Okay. Yeah, but the interesting thing is also if you're doing what Terry is talking about is taking into consideration the cost of living here, mm -hmm. then it becomes lower. So, yes. of course, this is why everyone in New York is paying so much more because the cost of living is so high. So why are we not then adequately compensating people for the cost of, additional cost of I mean... I hear you, but I, I well, we have the average for lunch or even between forty five fifty thousand dollars a year. I don't know that should be in the high fifties. And I think being in on the pack was an improvement over, say, 20 years ago mm -hmm. when we were at the lower end. And I, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. maybe um, could, because normally the amount increases by whatever the executive branch amount is, and maybe in the other states it's done differently. Yeah. So I think it has made it, it you know, it's it improved. Um, yeah, I do think versus I'm what just it used to be. Here, but um, I think it's probably done differently in other states. I think it's unique that we have sort of everybody gets the same. Oh, increase, and, That's and, cool. you know, and it's all three branches, all positions sort of get the same. It seems a little odd um, to me, but but also kind of nice, actually. I think it's so yeah, there, some states are unified, like Vermont. So it's it's a, it, the administration is from the state, so that's where you get the consistent salaries. In many states, especially bigger states, they're county based, and it's all yes. on the map. <laughs> um. Um, <laughs> I think there's something to be said for thinking about progressive increases. You know, if you make two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, six point four percent is a much larger, oh. like the just dollar yeah, amount, and you need yeah. it less than someone, say, starting out that we're really struggling to to recruit. So I, I do think there's something to be said. And I don't know if studies have been out there about a curve, but really yeah. looking at like how are we bolstering people coming into the field who are struggling the most. Mm -hmm. and maybe freeing up those funds from people maybe at the higher end of their field who make plenty to live comfortably and would have a much larger increase just because that's how percentages work. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> math. Math. It's not my strong suit, but I, have, I, can, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you both very much. Oh, sure. Thank you. Thanks for coming. And I'll email you the information. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. Okay. And I'll email you and Olivia just, and then I'll share with you. Okay, great. Um, Annie, we're going to try you again. Are you okay? Oh, yeah. we, heard you. we can't see you yet, but we heard you. Okay, I don't see how to turn this camera. Maybe it's a, is Olivia able to turn it on? Olivia's yeah. trying. Oh. Start my video. Yeah. Hey, yes. magic. That or do it. Can you start you the video? Look at, my, look at my wild, crazy hair today. No, no your hair looks lovely. Your hair is yeah, This is wild and crazy. What? <laughs> <laughs>
So I think you so hot while wow, it's so crazy. Annie, well first introduce yourself for the record, but you did hear yes. you did hear some of the questions that because I got little sticky notes from Olivia that you were calling in with the answers. So that's why I asked if you just join us. Oh thank you. Uh, for the record, Annie Noonan, uh, Department of State's Attorneys, Labor Relations and Operations Director. Uh, thank you for uh, cluing me into this today. I appreciate it. Um, so just to go to the questions that were being asked, so that uh, state attorneys, the 14 elected state's attorneys, their salaries are statutorily set. The uh, salary right now for a state's attorney is, and it's all the same. I saw that you were asking about, is there any variation on the, you know, such as for like a secretary of an agency or a commissioner where they can get up to 50% more? No, it is a straight set salary. It's 132148 except that uh, Chittenden County State's Attorney Sarah George receives slightly more than that. So as opposed to the 132 and change, Sarah receives 138. Part-time state's attorneys, which are in Essex County and Grand Isle Counties, um, which are um, uh, state's attorney Aluzi and DeSabato, they receive 99,100. And the theory being that their caseload is substantially less and that they are also permitted um, to take on other work um, as part-time state's attorneys. Similarly, the uh, sheriffs are also statutorily set. Their salary is um, now at 97754 except that Chittenden County State's um, Sheriff Dan Gamlin is um, $103,000 and change. And um, Grand Isle Sheriff um, Ray Allen is at 87,000 and change. And that is because Ray Allen is a level two. And if you remember, um, we've talked about this before, any any um, sheriff who is not level three certified has to take a percentage, a 10% cut. We've also talked about what would we do if we have someone who is not certified whatsoever. So there is there is that variation in the statute that was written in many years ago, I suspect. Um, a little bit about our bargaining. We also bargain with the SEA and we have two bargaining units. We have the state's attorney's offices and we have the state transport deputies. So the state's attorney's office staff include the deputy state's attorney, the victim advocates, our legal assistants, administrative support staff. Uh, we are now, we've, we are on our third two-year contracts. We will be on July 1st in our third two-year contract with the state's attorney's um, office staff. Um, you know, I shouldn't say this because I'll jinx myself in the department, but we've been very fortunate in that we've been able to settle all of those contracts without having to go to mediation or fact finding. That doesn't necessarily mean that we have any special formula or magic. It was just that um, um, I think that we've, it, it just worked out that way. We've had very collaborative negotiations um, and I think also the fact that we have limited numbers of position titles also helps. So, you know, some departments and in, in, in the executive branch have dozens of, of titles with dozens of competing interests. We're really small operation. We have 60 deputy state's attorneys, 28 victim advocates, and 31 administrative staff. You're talking a small group of people. And similarly, with the transport deputies, there's only 24 of them. And they all have the same job title. And, you know, our biggest challenge there was really to try to make sure that um, that, that the sheriffs were aware um, of collective bargaining and what their rights would be under a contract and all of that. But we had a, our first contract with them last year, which was a one year contract because we wanted to get them on the two year cycle of the executive branch. Um, our settlements have almost in terms of salary have matched almost exactly to the executive branch um, settlements in, in most of those years. There was a pay equity settlement in the first year of the state's attorney's offices um, that we, because of some compression issues, it, it involved um, some issues with people who had not been part of some legislative fix that went through years ago that, had, that I think was um, kind of popped on both uh, DHR and the department years ago. But uh, that was that had a little bit of extra money attached to it, but it brought everybody to where they thought they should be. Um, we've been very lucky. So our bargaining um, this year, 
Uh, so our state's attorney's contract is settled. Um, so I can say very specifically, it's at the four and a half percent and three and a half percent, the executive branch settlement. Our state transport deputies, we have had two, two negotiations. We're finishing up hopefully on Monday, but we have agreed on the money at four and a half and three and a half. So what that allowed us to do, um, and I want to give just tremendous shout out to Harold Schwartz, who I see sitting in the room, um, who has done our pay act for this department since as far as I've been there um, with, with the department here for years. And Harold is fastidious. I don't know if you've worked with Harold much. I've worked with Harold now for probably four decades. I also see John Berard. I've worked with John for decades. Um, Harold uh, gives us great guidance. Um, direction in terms of putting our numbers together and we go back and forth about what we th think we've come up with. He's running numbers from what I would call the the, the very uh, tr uh, large data set that he has over at the Department of Human Resources. So he's able to check our numbers. And when we get a uh, an email from Harold that says, good job, you know, we're, we're together, you know, we I think we're all together on this. We breathe a huge sigh of relief because, frankly, he has a very unenviable task to do that. John Berard's got the un unenviable task of bargaining, and then Harold's got to pull it all together. Um, part of the reason we bargain separately is because of the Vermont Supreme Court decision called in Ray election, which... I think we've talked about this before, which basically said, oh, all of you people are county employees. A bit of a stretch. We, we could talk about that for hours. I think DHR and I are, are on the same page. I won't bore you with that. But in essence, that's why we negotiate with separately. But again, two bargaining units. We bargain with the SEA. We've been very fortunate. Our Pay Act numbers are in through Harold, I hope. Um, uh and that's where we are at in terms of we're glad to be done the process and have you looking at this pay act number i will say pay act uh supporting the pay act funding is super important for the departments you know supporting the pay act in whole is critical when it's supported either and i've been around as you know um this process the pay act process since 1980 um so when a pay act is not supported in whole, basically what happens is um, departments then have to figure out how to fund that hole in their budget. So um, thank you for what you do. Support the pay act. I think you'll probably hear that from Com um, Commissioner Beth Vestigi, another great partner to our department. So we appreciate all of your efforts and I'll stop talking. Well, thank you, Annie. And yet we've heard that from everybody. Everybody's consistent in that. And that's actually super refreshing because, as you know, that's not usually the case with bills. Um, that's well, sure. I, I just want to clarify. Um, uh, it was said earlier before you joined us that that the money for your people are, is in the executive branch num numbers. Yes. But I, you would just want clarity because you said you weren't completely done with the transport deputies. Are they are also in there? I, I gave Harold the numbers uh, as an estimate, which actually landed correctly. So I we estimated them at the same percentage increase for the for the four point five and three point five. And even though we're not completely done that negotiation, we will probably be done on Monday. But that issue is done. We've agreed upon money with the SEA. Uh, okay, so they're included. Okay, good. So we don't have to add right. anything. Okay, Senator Bihoski. So I just have a couple of questions. So Grand Isle and Essex being part-time, they're part-time at 0.75 FTEs. I don't think it's ever, I don't Any statutory language, Senator, that actually says what that term part-time means. Um, so I would, I would say that um, both both um, uh, state's attorney Aluzzi and DeSabato, I would say work what they need to work to stay up with their docket. But I don't think there's any, uh, there's nothing that says in that, in that terminology that a part-time state attorney work 50% or 75%. I, there's nothing in the statute that, that says that. Okay, that's helpful. I mean, because I'm just, I, the only reason I came to that is because the pay is 75% of the other pay. So I, I'm just trying to understand how that number was arrived at. Um, I don't know if there is an answer or we don't really know. I think it, pre it, it well predates me. Okay. If, if there were, if there were legislative conversations, conversations on that, on that uh, it well, well dates, predates, predates my tenure, tenure here with the department. I suspect it was many years, years ago. ago. That's helpful. 
Then, so my other question is, I'm sliding on my judiciary hat a little bit. Um, is there no court backlog in either of those counties? So I'm a little confused why we would have a part-time state's attorney if we have extensive court backlogs. Do, I, do, don't I don't have, have that have chart in front of me, but it is done. Um, and there um, is, I, 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 I want to say, I don't say believe that there's, that there's not, I don't think, I don't that, think that, that any of the 14, of the 14 counties, counties are free of the backlog. So I think so you're I correct think there. there. I can I get you get that, that pretty, pretty much pretty almost, much almost when, when I hang up. Uh, Tim, uh, Tim um, has, has some information about clearance about rates and back and how many cases they're each handling, um, uh, and the uh, and offices and Essex and Grand Island included in that, so I can get you that. I, but everyone has some backlog. Yeah, I guess my, my question is just why wouldn't we increase for, you know, for 25% increase, why wouldn't we increase those positions to full time to help clear the backlog? And maybe it's not that simple. It just seems like, you know, in, in judiciary, we're talking about, you know, nine new state's attorneys or 30 or nine, yeah. not nine new state's attorneys, hiring more deputy state's attorneys at a pretty significant cost when we have these two part-time state's attorneys that could do, does my thinking make sense? Well, sure. And one of the things I will point out is that um, uh, Doug DeSavado from Grand Isle um, uh, for quite some time um, he was going down to assist Franklin County. You might remember the, the Bruja we had in Franklin County. I think everybody's quite aware of that. Um, but Doug was going down to Franklin County to assist down there. Um, and he also has been assisting in Lamoille County They have because of their backlog. Um, so he's, you know, it, it, it's often that um, he will raise his hand and say, where do you need me? I have some extra time. Um, they don't have as many court dates and even scheduled court dates. The court would, uh, uh, the court folks in the off in the room would tell you that. I see Terry sitting there, so they don't have as many court dates. But so Doug has often helped out. I suspect that, and I don't always know who's doing what, like who's helping out in other counties. I suspect Vince has probably helped out in other counties too. But it's a good question. Why did that? Why did they decide that those two counties? Well, if you think about. Also, the fact that Grand Isle County has grown. It's become a bit of a suburb to Burlington, correct? We all see that. So I don't know. Maybe back then there was so little work that they thought it should part-time would suffice. And maybe it is. It's probably a conversation worth having going forward next year. Thank you. All right. Maybe we put some language in about looking at that. Um, when, when that Grand Isle State's attorney does do extra work, I'm assuming he gets paid for it, yes? Or just... Is that just on his salary? Uh, well, we asked, I asked Doug and with John and the executive committee's approval to, I asked Doug if he would keep um, sort of a record of his hours and, and all of that. Of course, travel, we would reimburse um, at the 67 cents a mile. But I did ask that. And basically, I think what we did is we gave, uh, twice we gave Doug uh, what I would say a bonus for doing that. Well, because it was well beyond what, what would have been expected for a part-time state's attorney. It was a small, a small amount for really what okay. he was working on. So the amount was when he was helping cover for Franklin? For other counties. Yeah, yeah for Franklin County. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Annie, this is really, really helpful. Um, we're gonna have to move on, but um, yeah. if you're able to send over that chart. Um, I will definitely, yep. that, That'd be great. Get um, right to it. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah. Have a good, good afternoon. Enjoy the sun before, before the snow comes tomorrow. So no, nice. no. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Not for that news, but for your testimony. Bye, yeah. Annie. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Um, just, could someone just tell oh. Steve that we're ready for him? Um, I believe they're listening in. Oh, but... Steve. Steve. Oh, yes, <laughs> Steve. Yes, yes. Um, Steve Powell. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi. Hello, Madam Chair. You are our last witness, so. Say the best for last. Uh, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, sit, uh, sit down, join us, um, and tell us your perspective on this. All right. Well, for the record, I'm Steve Howard. I'm the executive director of the Vermont State Employees Association. And I'm here with Gary Hoadley, who is our director of labor relations and our chief negotiator, and Gretchen Naylor, who is our director of field services and also the lead negotiator on the judiciary contract. 
Excellent. Um, maybe we should introduce ourselves because you and I, neither of you have been in here before. We know Steve, but um, <laughs> I'm Senator Lou Hardy from the Addison District. I'm Olivia Parker, I'm the committee assistant. Uh, Tony Hopsky, Chittenden Central District. Hi, Rebecca White in Windsor County District. This would be Senator Bob Norris, but he had to leave for the day. Um, and I am Senator Ann Watson from the Washington District. Allison Clarkson, Windsor County District. All right, here you go. So I have four or five pages I'm just going to read. No, just oh, kidding. Yes. <laughs> Please do that. <laughs> That'll help the cause, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the members of the VSEA are uh, very supportive of the PAY Act and are uh, very happy that we were able to reach this agreement. Um, as you know, and you hear from me from time to time, uh, as of today on the DHR dashboard, there's 1,072 vacancies. So this is, as I see it, is a good start, a good down payment on uh, trying to make the state a more competitive employer in the state um, and trying to fill those vacancies, and particularly in those mission critical areas. You've heard about the judicial backlog and, and go on and on with the departments you've heard me talk about that are in a staffing crisis. Um, but we think this, uh, this agreement is a sound agreement and one that, um, that we hope that you will support and fund. That was really fast forward five pages. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any questions for Steve? And just so could you actually submit something brief in writing just for the record? Sure. Um, um, that would be great. Yeah. You want to bring your mom? Oh, we have everyone. I know. It's yeah, kind of weird. I um, mm -hmm. and, and nice. Very nice. Right. Right. Well, thank you. Um, we are going to. Oh, I have there's one a question. Quick ahead, question. Senator. And so there are both bargained for things in the Pay Act and things that have really nothing to do with the SAA are not bargained for, correct? Uh, in the Pay Act? Yes. Yes. So, so yes, the parts of the Pay Act that uh, we are, that we care about are the, uh, are the folks, are the agreements that we have negotiated with the administration Can or with the judiciary or with the... Can you like a super high level who that is? Oh sure. Like not every single department. <laughs> yeah. So we have uh, we we negotiate with the three big executive, well, three big executive branches: the corrections unit, the supervisors, and the NMU, non-management unit, which is the largest one. Uh, the Defender General, um, the Judiciary, the Office of State's Attorneys. We are negotiating right now for the uh, transport, the state transport deputies. Mm. Uh, I think that's from. Did I miss anybody in the? Did I miss anybody in the Pay Act? I think that's of all. The, those are the units that are in the Pay Act. I think. And for the offices of the state's attorneys, those are just the deputies, state's attorneys, and the administrative staff, not the actual state's attorneys. Right. So deputy. Yeah, we would. As Senator Senator Clarkson knows, at any moment we would love to change a statute, negotiate on behalf of legislators, because certainly. You are deserving of better compensation, and we think we would be very happy to be your union. Well, we're going to need your help. It's just saying <laughs> such nice things to us. They just feel bad for us well, at this point. As you know, this, here's, here's this is my favorite committee. <laughs> You're reminding me of... So, I asked the commissioner this, and for like a document that is the signed agreement, is there not no. a document that that is the agreement, or how do we get a chance to get a, a copy of whatever was actually yeah, the CBA. Um, I don't know that we have signed it yet. Um, have we signed it yet? We've signed we, the we have the agreements yes. that were reached during negotiations, which some of which are handwritten. But, oh, oh. Yeah. oh. But we, could we have this fancy system where John Berard sends me an email that I'm supposed to sign first, but of course I'm not going to sign it until I see that Gary has signed it. So we, it takes a while. We go back and forth. I send it to Gary. Should I sign this? Something for the record. But we'll get you something. Yeah. You know, right now it's lovely to have everybody come in and say they support, but it was just, and we have to build. But yeah. just sort of what is yeah. the general. We'll do our best to get that to you. Um, thank you, Senator Clarkson. So Harold said. You wrote the eighty percent, more than eighty percent of state government are classified employees, and of those, you represent. You're negotiating in this pad for how many employees? Well, uh, it, we have. Uh, there's, I'd say there's 
I'm going to just roughly ballpark it. We have we have roughly 6,000 members. Not all of those are in those units. Um, and we have 1,700 plus or minus um, non-members of the VSEA who are in who are also in those units for whom uh, we negotiate, even though they are not members of the VSEA. Um, so that's a ballpark figure. There's a there's a couple hundred in the colleges that don't that aren't included in these units. There's maybe another hundred. Well, there's like maybe fifty in the in the housing authority. How many? About fifty. Yeah. Um, and those aren't in the units. So it's about I would say 200, 250 of that number who are not in the in any of these units. That's for a total. Forty-five hundred or five thousand. Depends how what. Right. It's around. I would say it's around. It's it's around. It's just under. I'd say seventy-five hundred is a good ballpark number. Okay. Oh, great. That just gives us a sense. I mean, I did not. I don't do math in public because <laughs> I didn't do math. I did civics. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, I think we're going to be done for the day. We don't have possession of the bill. It's not actually even a bill yet. Um, so I'm trying to figure out what the agreed. process is and whether or not we're able to make any kind of tweaks to it. Um, uh, not about what's been bargained, but other things on the side. Um, uh, so I will see if I can get more information and we'll discuss maybe tomorrow. Hmm. Um, thanks, Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, everybody in the room for your work on this. It's really, it's really nice to see everybody in agreement. It makes our job easier. Thanks oh, again, Annie, on the screen. And we can go outside.